So, series or parallel? Parallel. Wait, 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 okay, how many series? Okay. Wait. Wait, wait, count. All right, let's do it again. How many? One, two, three, three, four, five, six. Okay. Yeah. How many parallel? One, two. You got it Actually, it's all series. Batteries? You will be all wrong in a minute. This way. Because I have a trick for you. You're always all wrong. That's in series. Okay, the batteries are in series. Okay, oh, hey, welcome in. You haven't been seen. But I didn't see you in Bojangles, so that wasn't going to do with Bojangles. Did you bring enough for the rest of us? Wow. My favorite rattlesnake, though. <laughs> I have a story about every little town in South Carolina. <laughs> and so it was a good night with my dad. While y'all getting your stuff out, we're doing this a little bit of reading. This is all serious. Batteries are serious. Some serious with the lamp. Little pushy button. It's all in series. But now. Series. Still in series. And just because Delbert said no there likes to throw curveballs at me. What about now? See, look at you. Why? Why is it? Don't answer that. Everybody else seeing what he's seeing. The batteries are still in series. The lights that we're turning on are in parallel. Okay. You're going to see a lot of things. Yeah, anytime you open up a, a schematic you know, of, a, of a radio or you know, some gadget that you buy, it's never going to be purely one or the other. It's always going to be both. So sometimes you just have to look through that stuff. That is, yeah, a little bit before that where you're at. We're just kind of backing up into the early part. Okay, so lots of cool stuff to cover tonight. So I've got a little video for you. All right, there's going to be a lot of little videos tonight. So our goal is to this video of one, you have to explain the difference between alternating and direct currents. And later on, we're actually going to analyze the pros and cons of each. Uh, the first kind of way to tackle is direct current. A direct current is what we call unidirectional. What that means is it only goes one way. It's a one way road or a one way street. This is just like batteries and circuits or anything with your remote controls and your Xbox, PlayStation, anything like that. So if we take a look down at the bottom, we have our battery and our circuit. The battery emits electrons, they flow through, they keep going, and they go through this one way. They just keep cycling on this one path. That's all they do. One way, UV direction. This is made famous by Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is the one that really tried to use this with their houses and almost powered towns over. He almost did it exclusively with direct current. But what happened is this man came along, and his name was Nikolai Tesla. Yeah. And he came up with this thing called alternating current. Nikolai Tesla actually now is a car guy, the, the Tesla. So, alternating current's a little bit different. As its name states, it alternates back and forth. It's bi-directional, two directions. Goes back and forth, alternates back and forth, left, right, left, right. This is what we use in our houses today. And we use what's called 60 hertz, which means that it alternates, it flips 60 times per second, not per minute, per second. So the electricity switches 60 times per second. And you can see that with our little lab activities here. So we're going to first go to direct current, one path. If you take a look at the electrons here, this is using our little FET activity, PHT. You can see the electrons are going one way, just one direction. That's it. There's no fancy alternating back and forth, just one direction. There's flow, here's a little, it's called an energizer. Alternating current, on the other hand, switches back and forth. And you can see that over here. You can see the electrons don't really move very far, but they're alternating back and forth, back and forth. Remember, this is a scale. Going so much faster. The one thing you probably see that's different is the 
these light bulbs. These light bulbs are flashing. They're not steadily on like our direction. What the difference is, is that when these switch directions, for a fraction of a second, they're actually stopped. They're dead stopped. But inside the light bulb stays glowing for that fraction of a second. The light stays there. You don't tell, you can't see the difference in between on and off that quickly. So remember, we talked about alternating current is 60 hertz. It changes 60 times per second. This, our little AC battery here, is only going about one time every second. It's changing one time every second. We can bump it up to two times a second. That's the most that the program can hold. So we can see that they're flashing a lot quicker now. Now imagine this times 30. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between flashing or on and off. It would just be constant on. And that's what happens in your house. You can't tell the difference between on and off. You can't tell the difference between, you can't tell when the electrons are switching back and forth. So we're going to jump to another program in a second, but I'm going to show you how this is done. And we can remember that light forces repel each other, electrons repel electrons, and opposite forces attract each other. So we've been talking about magnets a little bit, and alternating current is made with very big magnets moving very quickly. And we're going to go to our program over here. And this is a magnet right here, we're with south one. You can kind of think of this as positive thing. Here's a wire coil with electrons on it. If we start moving this magnet, it starts to move the electrons back and forth. If you follow them, they go back and forth. The magnet moves it. So this is how power companies work with alternating current. They have a giant magnet that rotates very quickly, and it moves the electrons and wires nearby. This is how alternating current is made. So once again, you can see the light bulb's flashing, nothing very special. If we crank this up quite a bit to 100 revolutions per minute, it's getting harder to see when it's off. Now, this is going at 100 RPMs per minute. To get to 60 hertz, which is 60 times per second, so we have to figure that one out. It's 60 times per second, and this is in minutes. So, we take 60 times 60, and it actually comes out to be 3,600 revolutions per minute. So we would have to multiply this by 36 times to get the actual speed of what a magnet travels at in a real power. Just something to think about with how electricity is made and brought from a power company into your house so you can cook your hot coffee. Okay, this is what you're gonna to need to know from today's little talk video. These are test questions. Direct current, one direct. Very close to the test DC, questions. Alternating current, AC, switches back and forth. Those are the simple ideas that we've got on this. And the bottom you really don't You also really need to know how alternating current is made with that spinning magnet and knowing that light forces repel each other and opposite forces attract. And the last thing everybody needs to know is ACDC is one of the best things ever. <laughs> okay, so anyway. <laughs> All right. Get well. All right. <laughs> now, hey, you know, I, I am I'm a firm believer you can learn just about anything you want to know on YouTube. Okay? The problem you have when you start looking at technical things is English is not the person's first language. Okay, so if you're if you if you're patient and have good hearing and you're in a, in a nice space that's not as live and crazy as this, there's some really good videos out there that can teach you a lot of stuff. Tonight, we're going to be doing little clips like this. So it's going to be me for a little while, but it's a big clip, back forth. Okay? So let's talk about measuring voltage. Okay, so we're getting, we're getting ready to head towards Ohm's Law, where we're going to have to solve some equations. All right, so if you're going to take a voltmeter, and yes, I did bring two utilities. Actually, I brought two. This has been my trusted companion since Shelly hatched, I think. A digital voltmeter. You have two leads. I can put this on AC voltage or DC voltage if I know what I'm trying to measure. But to measure a battery, DC, a direct current battery, I have to connect one lead, let me see if I can use the little green thing. I have to connect one lead here, 
one lead there. So my black lead would go there, my red lead would go up there. If I have them backwards, it's just going to put a negative sign on my display. Okay? Your car is 12 volts. Most of you, unless you're driving something really vintage, maybe six. Okay, so I'm going to send this around and trip when it comes past. I'm going to make sure we can take it down there to Tyler. And my little baby flute, be careful with the tips of these probes because sometimes they're a little sharp. This set is extremely sharp. All right, so these guys, if we, if we put it on DC volts and we measure that battery, it's going to tell us what the volt is. Okay, but how do we measure amps? Okay, so let's look at measuring an amp. To measure current, you have to be in the circuit unless it's a big electrical device and I can use a clamp on to read it. And clamp ohms do use an inductive coupling, which you guys will learn Probably won't worry about it in this class, but it's there. I should have brought mine. Yeah, mine's on the bench at the house. I'm also introducing something new here. Every time I draw something, it's time to start introducing you to new little schematic pieces. So F1 there is a fuse. Anybody know what a fuse does? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a fuse is a safety device that opens when you draw too much current through it. Okay, with a battery in the light bulb, if that fuse is any reasonable size, it's a piece of wire. But, you know, if I do something silly, well, maybe it'll pop. I doubt it will with a single battery. But I have to put, I have to disconnect the path. Remember, we had a path across there in the previous slide, right? A piece of wire. So in this one, I have to break the circuit to be able to measure it. Okay, does that kind of make sense? If it doesn't make sense, it's okay. You can just, just say something, I'll try to explain it. So we're going to be talking about, we have talked about volts, you know, energy. We've talked about amperage, which is current. The voltage is potential, current actually does the work, okay? So we're getting ready to fly into Ohm's Law, but then again, I know a lot of you guys are going to try things at home. And as you start hooking up the stuff in your station at home or in your car, a voltmeter is a good thing. You can buy the inexpensive ones for 20 bucks. Okay. I think I got a $9 Harbor Freight one at the house. The test leads will, a $2 one? Thanks, Phil. Yeah, so good. they're really cheap. They're good things to have in your throwaway box. I will tell you this if the leads are as sharp as the little guy that went around the class, put a piece of tape or something other on it. Or some people have seen screw wire nuts on them. Because yeah. if not, when you dig in your tool bag, it will bring blood. <laughs> okay, so kind of looks for me what I passed around, right? A little, little close to it. This video was too good to pass up, y'all, because it's real simple and real short. Power multimeters and how to use them to measure voltage, current, resistance, and continuity. First up, where do you buy a multimeter? Well, multimeters are everywhere. You can get them at Radio Shack, Sears, Dollar Stores, Walmart, Amazon, eBay, whatever's easiest for you. Okay, so how do you choose which one to get? First up, at a bare minimum, make sure the meter you're looking at can measure voltage, current, resistance, and continuity. If you can find one that measures capacitance and temperature as well, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're working with some super special application, don't worry too much about accuracy. Plus or minus 2% is usually good enough. And even cheap multimeters these days will be that accurate or better. Next, the multimeter should have a digital display, not that old school analog. Hey. And it should have auto range of functionality for as many things as possible. Hey. Trust me, you don't want to waste your time screwing around with manual range. If you're too lazy to shop around, just get this one. 50 bucks will do everything you need and it will not grow at any time soon. Okay, so now you have a multimeter. How do you use it? Let's start with measuring the DC voltages. First, check the cables. Make sure the black lead is in the jack labeled COM or COM. And once it's in there, you'll never need to take it out because the black lead always goes to COM. The red probe, on the other hand, is something you'll have to pay very close attention to. If you plug it into the wrong jack, you will blow a fuse in your multimeter. We want to measure voltage right now, so I'm plugging in the red lead into the jack labeled volts, not amps. Next, set the dial to measure DC voltage. Touch the red probe to the positive terminal of your device and the black probe to the negative terminal of your device and you should get a voltage reading. 
If you get the wires backwards, that's okay. You'll just get a negative reading on your multimeter. And that's actually a good way to figure out polarity. Now you can measure voltages in pretty much any DC circuit, as long as you're careful to not short anything out of the metal probes. Okay, let's move on to measuring AC voltages. Set the dial to the AC voltage setting, and again, make sure the red lead is in the jack labeled voltage. Touch the probes to the AC voltage source that you want to measure, and you'll get your reading. As long as you don't touch the metal parts of the probe or short them out, this is perfectly safe. And as you would expect, there's no AC voltage coming out of this DC battery. Measuring resistance is easy too. Make sure the red lead is in the jack labeled ohms for resistance, and set the dial to the resistance setting. Here's me measuring the resistance of the scale on my hand. Here's me measuring the resistance of a resistor. And here I am measuring the resistance of a speaker. Now, you might be wondering if you can measure the resistance of something in a circuit. Well, unfortunately, it most likely won't work. You're going to have to remove the resistor from the circuit before measuring it. Next, let's talk about continuity. Measuring continuity basically just means checking whether or not there's a good connection between any two points in a circuit. To measure continuity, make sure your red probe is in the jack label continuity, or in my case, resistance, and set the dial to the continuity setting. Test that the continuity function is working correctly by touching the probes together. Whenever there's almost zero resistance between two points, the multimeter will beep. You can use the continuity function to check if cables are internally broken or not. In the context of circuit boards, if there's a good copper trace between any two points, the multimeter will beep. If the circuit board is messed up, no news for you. Finally, let's use our multimeter to measure current. Set the dial to the app setting. For almost all multimeters, there's going to be a separate jack just for measuring current. My multimeter has two, one for currents up to 10 amps and one for currents up to 400 milliamps. I usually start out with the amps jack, but if I need more accuracy, I can switch to the milliamps jack later. Now, measuring current is a little trickier than the rest of things. I can't just touch the probes and get an amp reading. In order to see how much current is flowing through a wire, I have to cut the wire and splice in the multimeter in series with the flow before I can get a measurement. Here I have a simple circuit with a battery pack, a motor, and some wires. In order to measure the current drawn by the motor, I cut the wire, splice in the multimeter, and now I can see that the motor is drawing 60-ish milliamps. If I want more accuracy, I can switch to milliamp settings and now I can see that the motor is drawing somewhere between 57 and 63 milliamps. Alright, thanks for watching and have fun with your new multi Alrighty! Alrighty! Alrighty then! So, I'll give you a little tease and then we went right into it. Okay, so before we can move on to dealing with Ohm's Law, and if you read ahead, you know we're coming up to Ohm's Law. We have to talk about one more piece. The infamous resistor. Schematic symbol is a squiggle. That one ended up with a little egg on the end of it because I was not watching what I was doing in Vizio. We're going to, I got a little video that's going to walk you through the color bands. It's real simple. You do not need to know this for your test. This is all foundational material so that what's on the test makes sense. It, this, has been, this has been a week where I have struggled in places because when we get towards the end of tonight, there's going to be things that I can't fully develop because it's not covered in this license test. But yet to understand the concepts, the book fell short by just telling you something that was sort of vague. So there's some, there's some interesting setups tonight. Uh, is it better with the lights on or off? I mean, we can go on and off or we can just leave them on. Or we can just leave them off. It's up to you guys. Uh, on or off, Phil? On. On. Okay. Phil, the videographer, says we're on. So we're going to stay on. If you have trouble seeing, by the way, all of this stuff will be posted. Anybody look at the stuff from the first night that I posted? All the videos are there, the links to them. All the PowerPoint stuff are there in the slide. I use Google Slides so you don't have to own PowerPoint to do that. So, okay, all of this will be up. This is good refresher stuff for later. When you're trying to remember stuff, you can always go back to that classroom. I'm not planning on taking it down. So the material's gonna sit out there until Google decides they want their storage space back. And I don't think they know I'm there because I'm just a little itty bitty fish in a great big ocean. All right, so let's dive into this. Color coding. 
with markings or bands that allow you to quickly identify oh, okay. resistance values and tolerance. Using a color chart table will allow you to determine the value of any common four band resistor. Memorizing this color chart will enable you to become proficient at quickly decoding and using resistors. In a four band resistor, the first two bands represent the digits or significant figures. The third band indicates the multiplier. And the fourth band indicates the tolerance. You read resistor bands beginning with the end that has the most bands. A space between the third and fourth bands also indicates the reading direction. The first band is red, so the first digit value is 2. The second band is violet, so digit 2 is 7. The third band is yellow, so we multiply the first two numbers by 10 to the fourth, or 10,000. Thus, the value of this resistor is 270 kilo ohms with a tolerance of plus or minus 5%. In this example, the first band is orange, so the first digit is 3. The second band is white, so digit 2 is 9. The third band is silver, so we multiply the first two numbers by 10 to the negative second power, 4.01. In this instance, we would take the 39 and move the decimal point two places to the left, resulting in a value of 0.39 ohms. Thus, the value of this resistor is 0.39 ohms, with a tolerance of plus or minus 10%. Now, let's determine what the bands would be on a 15 kilo ohm resistor. Since the first digit is 1, the first band would need to be brown. The second digit is 5, so the band color would need to be green. The resistor value is 15,000 ohms, so we need to add three zeros to 15. Three zeros is 1,000, so we need to have a multiplier of 10 to the third. Thus, the third band would need to be orange. The last band would need to be silver, to indicate that the resistor has a tolerance of plus or minus 10%. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? This is not on your test, and the reason why we're doing this is because things that are on your test that you're gonna to need to understand starts like this. So our first little formula of the night is resistors in series. So if I have, and this is where I'm going to use the old whiteboard up here. If I have, if R1 is equal to 10 ohms and R2, and I'm going to keep the math simple, you don't need a calculator. 10 ohms, R total, or R sub T is... Okay, our formula is there in purple. RT is equal to... R1 plus R2. So our answer is 20 ohms. Everybody good with that? Okay. I said, this is stuff. I didn't see it in the test, but to understand a lot of the things that we're going to do tonight, we might as well cover this simple little thing. Anybody still writing? If you need time, I'm writing. Okay. So now the curveball. And I'm going to make it real simple numbers again so we don't have to calculate it. Okay? Pretty good? I think there'd be nuggets of interesting stuff tonight. Resistors in parallel. We have the, the formulas up there. 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. You can take a scientific calculator and do this. Or, for tonight's exercise, we're going to stick with R1 and R2 are both equal to 10 ohms. If you do the math on the calculator, and I'm going to save you the trouble tonight, there's an interesting thing when you have two resistors in parallel that are the same value. The math actually works out to half of one. Okay, so R sub T on this, in this case, is 5 ohms. 
If you want to take your phones and flip your calculators out and run that formula, you're going to find the answer is 5. There is an app. David has got some apps over here. If you guys are interested, you can just plug the stuff in and poof, there it comes. Yes, sir. The one thing that I always get switched on when I'm looking at schematics at work, is it voltage or current that is divided between the resistors? The, there's a voltage drop across the resistors the current would be divided by. Thank you. Okay, and don't worry about that, guys. It's occasionally, he's, Tyler works in avionics. Occasionally, he's going to ask me something just to help plant seeds in his own mind. So it's okay. No worries. All right. All this stuff will be on the site. You can look it up online. I'm pretty sure that none of that is in the test. But you know what is? Yes. Ohm's law. Mr. Ohm and his laws. So, got a little video for you. This one gets a little wieldy, but we're going to work a couple examples on the other side because there's a couple of things that we can do. If you look at, what page is that right there? Yeah. 3 5. There's two little wheels there. One says EIR and the other one says PIE. Yeah. So, got a few things to look at. You, you'll love this. Okay. All right, let's watch this little video. And this is going to show a combination of these two graphs, these two circles, because it kind of works together. Me time to take notes. I want to talk about the first kind of current flow, which is DC, direct current. Current flows only in one direction, and the circuit has polarity, negative and positive. The next kind of current flow is alternating current, AC. Alternating current means that current flows one way and back again, many times a second. Oh, but at the right in the United right States, place. it's 60 times a second, or 60 hertz. Hertz is frequency. Hang on a second, guys. I may have one out of place. And the next? Nope, I'm in the right place. I'll re Yeah. My bad. Using simple math to determine if we have the right measurements to kind of predict what we should have in the circuit. E is electromotive force, which is what we measure in volts. R is resistance, we measure in ohms. And the symbol for ohms is the omega symbol, seen here in red. I is intensity, and that is our current flow that we measure in amps. This is what we call the direct current Ohm's law wheel. With this wheel, we can solve any DC circuit using simple math. For now, we're only going to focus on three different formulas. At the one o'clock position, we have amperes. We can determine how many amps we should have by dividing our volts by our resistance. At the four o'clock position, we can determine how many ohms we should have by dividing our voltage by our current. And we can determine how many volts we should have by multiplying current times resistance. To break this down even simpler, draw this out in your notes. Here is how we use this very simple wheel that we created. By knowing two values, we can calculate the unknown value. By covering up the unknown value, we've created a multiplication, I times R. So let's say we have four amps and three ohms. The answer would be 12 volts. Four times three is 12. Let's say we want to figure out how many amps are going to flow through our circuit. We take our voltage and divide it by our resistance. When we cover up our unknown value, we've created a division problem. So let's say we have 10 volts and 2 ohms. What is our amperage? Our amperage is 5 amps. Let's say we would like to calculate how much resistance a device exhibits on our circuit. We could cover up the unknown value, which is the R for resistance. We've created another division problem. 
E over I. So let's say, again, we have 10 volts and 5 amps. How much resistance do we have in our circuit? The answer is 2 ohms. Remember, the symbol for ohms is the omega symbol shown at the bottom of this picture. Remember I said using this wheel allows us to solve any formula in a DC circuit. Everything in yellow is how we can calculate amperage. We use this formula, E over R, to solve for amperage, or I. This part of the wheel gives us three ways to solve for voltage, or E. We use this formula, I times R, to solve E, or volts. This part of the wheel gives us three different ways to solve for ohms, or resistance. We use this formula, E over I equals R, or ohms, how much resistance is in the circuit. The part of the circle we haven't discussed yet is watts. The definition of watts is heat dissipated. Watts equals power. And the symbol for watts can be W or P. To remember how to calculate watts, remember the word pi, P-I-E. P, or watts, equals I times E. Current times voltage equals watts. Here is the part of the wheel where we can calculate watts. There are three different formulas to find wattage. The formula that we just discussed, and that you should know right now, is from the word pi. P equals I times E. Remember, watts is heat dissipated. A 100-watt light bulb feels hotter than a 20-watt light bulb. Since we're a little ahead of schedule, this is good. Because uh, we've actually get out of here earlier tonight. I didn't have so many times to run all of this stuff. And we're actually clocking along pretty nicely. Uh, so to be able to use that formula, so what would we ever use that formula for? Yeah, pretty much, because if, if, let's say it's just something real simple, I want to put some yard lights in my backyard. Okay, I know the wattage of light bulb, now this excludes LEDs, folks, this is the old stuff. If I have a 100 watt light bulb, and I know the voltage is 120 volts, I can apply the formula and know how much current it's going to draw. Why would I want to know how much current it's going to draw? See, for sizing the wire that feeds it. Okay, because Despite popular opinion, itty bitty little lamp cord is only good for so many amps. Above that, the resistance in the wire will actually burn itself up and towards the carpet and burn your house down if you run it under the carpet lights and people like that. Actually, yeah, well, yeah, it will eventually burn out. Uh, if you use big enough lamp cord in a, in a big enough load in a car, you can uh, pretty much uh, smoke the floor mats and you know, burn a brand new police cruiser to the ground, but I don't happen to have a, an example of that. It happens, okay? All of this stuff, so there's safety in this, there's electronics in this, this is good knowledge. Tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and load the second. Let's see, did we miss anything? Yeah, there was one, and it was real short, it's only a minute, there's no video for it. But since, since we're a little early, let's talk about the difference between conductors and insulators. Conductors or what? So we know wire conducts electricity? People. People? Why do people? Water. Water conducts electricity. Okay. That's that's why if you ever see you know a sign wet floor and they're working with electricity. Well, yeah, they're in rubber boots and they got a ground fault little uh, isolator there in case. They see any voltage on that ground, it's going to trip circuit. Okay, it's a safety thing. So, wire is good, pennies are good, okay, copper, silver, gold, nickel. Okay, how about plastic? What's plastic? If it's not a conductor, it's got to be a insulator. Okay, air. Air is an insulator, believe it or not. Okay, foam materials usually insulators, rubber bands are insulators. 
Those are things when we have to hold two conductors apart. We have to use something to keep that space. It may be air. It may be plastic. It could be paper. Okay. So the insulation is important as long as we're in. That's the only real big thing about conductors and insulators. I don't know if there's any test questions on it. But I can tell you that a glass bottle is a good insulator. Yeah. You know, it's the reason you see these ceramic things up on the light poles. Those are insulators. Now, yeah, I'm, I'm pointing, but there's nothing up here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so anyway, just keep that in mind. So insulators, conductors, got to be one or the other. There's a whole lot of physics behind that if you ever want to nerd out. I promise you there's some really good physics there with valence fans, okay? If you want to nerd out, it's good. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. If you want to take a break, if not, I'm going to load this next PowerPoint. We're going to run for the, run for the board now. All right, so let's dive in. All right, so from our wheel, we have E over I, R. E, voltage. I, current. R, resistance. I told you I was going to make this math real simple. Oh, wait a minute. I'll put a teaser up here. If air is an insulator, how can lightning strike? Because you pissed off God. No. It's real simple. You want to venture a guess? Because even air has a resistance rating. Okay, so there is a there is a voltage that you can hit in a different dimension. Well no. It's a, it's a there is a voltage at which you can eventually hit that any insulator will conduct. Air happens to be 10,000 volts to an inch. If you really want to think about the power of a lightning bolt, if it takes 10,000 volts to bridge an inch, yeah, if we can harness lightning, we will never need to drill in the earth again. All right, so let's do some math. So in this case, we're trying to solve for R, okay? So the guy talked about covering up stuff, right? So if I cover up the R, it becomes E over I. Okay, our voltage is 10 volts. Our current is one amp. What is our resistance? Okay. 10. So yeah, I was gonna go easy on the math tonight, didn't I? Okay, we don't know what I is. So if I cover up I, Again, it's E over R. Do what? One. One. I know one. All right. All right, so we have 10 ohms and one amp. What's our voltage? 10. See, we could make the numbers real difficult, then you'd have to do math. It's not about math, it's learning how to take a simple little reminder E over IR and be able to use it and spin it in. Okay, so about that power thing, right? So here is a real simple reason for needing the power formula. Okay, if I know I've got 10 volts and one amp, how many watts of power is being applied across that resistor? Okay, so I times E, 10, 10 watts. Now, if you've ever looked at resistors, the little itty bitty ones that you see on all the circuit boards are a quarter watt. Okay, so if I'm going to need to dissipate that much energy, that resistor's got to be big and wire -wide. It may even have heat sink fins on it to dissipate the heat. Because Chances are, with a little bit of aluminum foil over the top of it, I can heat my lunch in there if I leave it long enough. Okay? This is just an example of that formula. Now, I know some people are going to ask me, I have a 100-watt radio in my car that runs on 12 volts. Can I figure that out? Yeah, with one exception. It's not pure DC. We're creating an AC waveform, okay, because our radio signal that we're pushing out is not 100% efficient. So 
a certain amount of that of that amperage that's used there. Okay, or if we work it backwards, I'm drawing this many watts or this many amps at this voltage. I can calculate the watts. On. Some of that is dissipated. So don't try to use this formula to come up with what is my power out of a radiator. Okay, make sense? Okay, good. Now we're getting ready to get fun because some of the things you do have on your test are schematic symbols. We've introduced several of them. Let's introduce a new one. Capacitor. You <coughs> ever heard of a capacitor? Yes. Yes. All the electronic students, when I was in college, we all decided that you know we would go stand out of you know where tuckers would stand out in front of the airports and sell capacitors for the for the audience. I'm just kidding. We actually did talk about that. A little video that'll explain it better than I can with a lot nicer video. I do apologize for the cheesy music. I didn't pick it. Been taught a different way, but 
doesn't matter. The point you're trying to get out of the capacitor is the capacitor stores energy. If you open a box, a power supply, that's got these large capacitors in there, okay, they're probably got like a blue shrink or a gold shrink on, and then there's a black band with a minus sign and a bunch of minus signs pointing to one side. That's just telling you which, which terminal is negative versus which is positive. But if they're large, treat them with care because even weeks after that supply is turned off, those things may still be holding a charge. They hurt. They do hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and we you know, we used to have a lot of fun with that because I, I know guys that were, you know, when we were back in school that would charge them and just put them back in the ditch. Cool. Yeah. You know, those guys never made it to the end. We killed them all. Because you know, we wanted them out of the gene pool. All right, so capacitors. It's okay, man. I thought it'd be funny. If I'm not funny, just nod. You know, it's okay. So the next one's inductors. Inductors are different than capacitors. They work absolutely opposite in multiple ways. So let's see the cheesy little inductor video. And I think I have, this is the one I need to. There's one that the music's just so repulsive I had to turn down. Maybe it's not this. Maybe it was capacitors. Yeah, let's do this. No, I think it's this one. That's this one. Somebody that built slide side needs to use it and put it in the way. You're having The purpose of an inductor is to oppose any change in the magnitude of current within a circuit. The electrical property that resists either an increase or decrease in current is known as inductance. An inductor is created when an electrical current flows in a wire wrapped around a magnetic core. You may recognize this as an electromagnet represented by flux lines that develop around the core with the formation of a north and south pole at their respective ends. To demonstrate the properties of an inductor, we'll add a resistance or light bulb to this circuit. As the switch is closed and the current flows through the circuit, the electromagnetic field in the inductor forms and expands rapidly. However, because of the unique properties of an inductor, as the flux lines of the electromagnetic field expands, the changing current generates a voltage that resists the current coming from the source. The maximum opposition to current flow occurs at the instant the switch is closed. Therefore, the bulb will not turn on instantaneously. However, once the electromagnetic field stops expanding based on the level of changing current, the flux will no longer generate an opposing voltage in the circuit. The current will continue to flow and reach its maximum value after five time constants, or 5T, where T is equal to L divided by R. The light bulb will then be at its maximum brightness. If you open the switch and stop the flow of current from the source, the electromagnetic field will diminish rapidly and simultaneously release stored energy in the form of voltage. It will actually generate enough voltage to cause a spark across the switch as it opens, whereas a capacitor uses voltage to store energy. The inductor uses current. Inductance of an inductor is defined as the amount of voltage induced divided by the change in current per second. This is not one of those. Therefore, if 1V is induced by a change of 1A in one second, there is one Henry, one H of inductance. Say that for how fast. Yeah, okay, so the big takeaway there is, remember we're talking about how capacitors store energy, okay, and it does it through these two poles that are separated. All right, so in a loop of wire wrapped around maybe an iron core, yeah. maybe a ferrite core, we have these lines of magnetism that are created that behave the opposite direction. So. I'll get back to that in a second. I want to pick up transformers here while we're at the inductors. Okay. Transformer basically is two inductors that share a common center point. 
or, or pole. And you have turns on one side, turns on the other side. So if you're looking at a wall ward that you would buy to plug up something, if it's an AC wall ward, all it is is 120 to some other voltage transform in there, okay? I see some scribbling still going on, so everybody good? Like I said, all of this stuff will be up on the site so you can use it. That's your the wall ward here? The little power plugs you plug in the wall and you plug it in. Like the cell phone. Cell phone, you know, electronic keyboard, drone. <laughs> All right, so this is a quick explanation of transformers for you. Transformers are composed of an iron core ring wrapped in coils. One coil is connected to an AC input voltage and is called the primary coil. The other coil is connected to an output circuit with a low resistance and is called the secondary coil. The two coils are well insulated from each other and do not form a physical electrical connection. This gives a transformer its unique electricity altering properties. Transformers can either step up or step down a voltage. In a step-down transformer, the number of turns in the primary coil is greater than the number of turns in the secondary coil. In a step-up transformer, the number of turns in the secondary coil is greater than the number of turns in the primary coil. The constantly changing current driven by an alternating voltage source induces a changing magnetic field in the core of the transformer. The magnetic field created by the alternating current in the primary coil generates the flux in the transformer core. The secondary coil converts the flux back into current flow and produces a voltage at the load or resistance in the secondary circuit. If there are fewer coil turns on the secondary than on the primary, this is called a step-down transformer. The resulting voltage in the secondary circuit will be less than the primary. In this example, we have 20 turns on the primary coil and 10 turns on the secondary coil. To determine the decrease in voltage occurring in this step-down transformer, we can use a simple ratio formula. This formula simply states that the secondary voltage to primary voltage ratio is the same as the secondary coil to primary coil turn ratio. Rearranging the formula and then dividing 10 turns by 20 turns, we get 0.5 multiplied by 120 V. This results in a calculated step-down voltage of 60 volts. Okay, everybody cool with that? Okay. So, in transformers, remember how we saw the lines of magnetism around that inductor a while ago? So, if you can imagine those lines expanding out, use this, they expand out over there, then that is induced into that. And that's how it creates that voltage. That the magnetic fields, once it's increasing on one side, start increasing on the other side and create a voltage. The number of turns on either side, be it more or less, you know, if there's more on the primary than it's less on the secondary, then the step down, of course, step up the other way around. But that energy connects through that through magnetism. Okay, so it's induced voltage. And that's how we get voltage other than 120 for everything we use. Okay, here's another trick. Remember in the first, maybe it was last week when I was talking about AC, you know, we had that nice sine wave. And the cool thing about that was we went way down this country road and the voltage started falling off that we could go through a transformer and step it back up. Okay, if you get way out on the end of the grid, out where I live, there's people down the hill from me that there may be a couple more miles of power line between my house and their house. And my voltage at the house hangs right about 120, but for them to get 120, that little bank of transformers up on the pole they just boost that back up. Now, they give away some current for that, 
because there's current being used to transition the power. It needs more to make more. So in a big building like this, the power coming into the Timmy Hospital is not 120 volts. So how do we get 120 out of the outlet to power my stuff? There are big step-down transformers in here. Because this is more, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is 483 phase. So there are step-down transformers to make all of this. The lights in here are probably on 277 because that's the single leg of 480. So you don't have to know all of that, but just know that this is how we're getting there. There are audio implications for this too. How many people, how many musicians in the house? Okay, musician, 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 good. So we use a direct box. We can plug something into a direct box so all there is in there is a little transformer. And the turns ratio between the input and the output is what gets us that impedance change from 10,000 or one mega ohm to 600 ohms to drop a very long line like this microphone that Phil has up here. Where Phil's using it to record that 600 ohm balance or eh, not really low impedance, but fairly low impedance for audio versus a guitar, which may be very high in these. So we can use this to match things. So when you open up you know, a, a radio or something in there, or you open up you know, any audio circuits, you may find little transformers in there. And that's all it's doing, is bridging that gap, making whatever this circuit's operating at happy with what this one's operating at. In layman's terms. Yeah. A, a, a capacitor stores electricity or stores energy. Right. The inductor. The inductor stores its electricity in lines of magnetism. Okay. So here's something that's not on the test, but it's going to make a little more sense towards that end. When you move up to a general class license, you're going to pick up some things like reactive. You're going to have to know some formulas. You're going to have to do some much more difficult math. One of the principles this is based on is, is kind of an old riddle. Everything in electronics is taught with some way to remember it. Well, when you're talking about voltage and current and inductors and capacitors, Eli the Iceman is a really good one to remember. Okay? So in an inductor, voltage leads current. Okay, in an inductor. L is the inductor, right? In Henry's, that was our symbol. Remember the little symbol from earlier? So voltage is in front of current. Okay, and a capacitor is backwards. So when you put a capacitor across, remember when they hooked it across the battery to charge it? If you had an amp meter in there, your maximum current would happen at the time you connected. And if you had a volt meter across that capacitor, you would watch the voltage rise. Okay? And in inductor, it's the other way around. As soon as you apply power, voltage is at max. But the current through the circuit has to rely on those lines of magnetism to be created. Okay? Like I said, this is not on the test but it's fundamental to understanding something that's coming that is on it. Okay? Because we talk about the next two things we're going to talk about are impedance, reactance, and then we're going to get into resonance. Now, as I told you early in the class tonight, there were things I struggled with because they give you a little bit, but they didn't give you any foundation for it. The foundation is very, very deep math, but to understand it, we kind of have to think through some of these things, okay? So, I went and pulled some definitions. In an AC environment, I'm not talking about air conditioned environment, but AC, alternating current, almost every component in a circuit exhibits two things that you don't expect it to have, capacitance and inductance. And that's just by the very nature of it. Only in DC, remember earlier in the slides when we were talking about circuits, they said only in DC. 
because if it does not have a frequency associated with it, it's just flat DC, everything behaves itself. In AC environments, everything has multiple personality disorders. Okay, it's, it's okay to look at it like that. So, a capacitor will have a certain amount of inductance. An inductor will have a certain amount of capacitance. And I can tell you in radio circuits, if you have a tunable capacitor, and we really didn't go in there, but it's in your schematic list, all it is is a capacitor that has a little line through it with an arrow on one end, which basically means it's variable. Okay? Same way you can have variable inductors. Usually those are roller inductors. That there's a shorting bar that rides back and forth to make it longer or short. Everything has both inductance and capacitance. And if you stick your hand in to turn, you know, to take a screwdriver and turn one of those little variable capacitors, it's going to get squirrely for a minute. And you go, why? Okay, and you notice that if I pick up a different tool, the effect is different. Okay, we refer to that usually as hand capacitance. My hand being there is upsetting that surface. Okay, the screwdriver that I've used, it's a metal shaft may upset. That's why we have plastic tweakers or plastic screwdrivers to turn those things and get your hand far enough away where your hand doesn't affect the surface. Now, if you get out into experimental land and start building and homebrewing some stuff, which I strongly encourage you to do, because you learn the most when you have to apply it, you build it. Even if it's a kit. Kit building is something that's gone completely out of the mainstream. We believe Amazon will have it to me in two days. Back in the 60s, a lot of the hand gear was built by hands. They soldered the components in themselves out of a kit for a little company called Heath Kit. Some of us call it grief kit because not always did their instructions make all the sense in the world. So you had to apply some good old you know, knowledge base to this stuff. Everything has capacitive and inductive properties inside a radio. Okay? Thus the term reactance and the term impedance are introduced. Those are things that, that impede or diminish our signal. The reactants is things that react together. And there's some long formulas like capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. You can wear a good calculator out doing that. I've lost a couple in my life that I wore the keypads out on just from running formulas. For the purpose of this class, we don't have to deal with that. Just do that the extra. Is it an extra now? Yeah. Good. Do a network and extra. Ne network's an extra, okay. Which is interesting because in technician, why the crap am I talking about resonant circuits? And that's where we're headed. Let's first talk about impedance. The effective resistance, and this is just right off of old Google, okay? The effective resistance of an electrical circuit component to alternating current arising from the combined effects of ohmic resistance, and I cut the slide off. It's okay. So what that basically means is everything in an AC circuit versus a DC circuit. You're looking at the way things behave in relationship to its neighbor. So you, can you measure it with a meter? You can measure the DC resistance of something, but the impedance is going to be different. Probably the best place to figure this out or to shed some light on it is speakers. All of us are going to hook something up, probably a speaker. A speaker has an impedance. Okay, if you get in the weeds and pull the tech specs on the driver, you'll find it has a DC resistance. Why is the DC resistance one value and the impedance a completely different value? And the difference is I'm not putting DC on this thing, but if I measure it with an ohmmeter and I measure the resistance, an 8 ohm speaker may have a DC resistance of 4.3 ohms. It doesn't make it a 4 ohm speaker. It just means the DC resistance is 4.3 ohms. So when we're trying to figure this out, speakers in series, 
come out of one, loop through another, pay it. Okay, remember when we did resistors a while ago? 10 ohms and 10 ohms equals 20 ohms. But we had that funky little formula with all the one overs. Same thing applies. So on that side, two eight ohms is four. Okay, you can do the math. I promise it'll work. The big thing to remember is we're talking impedance. The other place we see impedance in radios is the impedance of a microphone or the feed point impedance of an antenna. And we'll cover the antennas in about two weeks. Just you need to understand that impedance is not a DC thing, it's not resistance. Because it has some capacitive reactants, it has some inductive reactants because it's in an AC environment. Okay? Everybody good? Some of this you may just have to take me at my word. Go on Google, research it. YouTube's got a lot of cool stuff out there. A lot of great videos that sometimes you sit there and you just watch your own brain cells melt. I watched a couple this week that were like, they were cool for me. It's like, I couldn't explain my way out of this if I had to. Resonance. Okay, if I take a capacitor and an inductor and I marry them together, there is a given frequency that they will naturally resonate at. How many of you ever heard feedback in a sound system? Okay, that's a product of all the amplification and the acoustics in the space are creating that resonant circuit where it just wants to howl. Same thing. We're taking two things that should not do that, the room and the, the electronics. Either one by themselves doesn't do it. Put it in the room, it wants to take off and, and misbehave. Same thing. So if I apply a little bit of voltage to it, now they start to oscillate or become at a resonant frequency. And this is how we tune things. Okay? So when you're sitting there dialing that knob on the old radio, not the nice digital one, but you go back to the analog one where the little meter moved in the uh, display of the radio, you're actually turning variable capacitors that have an inductor against it and a circuit to help amplify some things to make it want to ring, to give it a little power. But you're changing a frequency that it operates at that determines what radio station I pick up. In our, the beginning of last week, we were looking at how a radio hears. And there were all those humps back in chapter two, okay? And we said that right now we, we won't listen to this one, but I can see one over here, over here, over here, and over here. Well, something has to change. So the change that I'm making is in a tuning circuit that's made up from a, a capacitor and an inductor. Remember, they transform energy very different. Okay? So I'm going to show you this little video, and then we're going to talk about the, uh, the last slide. Believe it or not, this is actually the last slide. You guys have been great. You didn't ask me a lot of questions. There wasn't a lot of discussion. I mean, most of you didn't even want to go out of the room for a break, so it must be great. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm holding everything to man, there you go. Okay, and you know what we may do? I may just pull up a chair and let everybody else that don't want to you know, have nosebleed from where we're probably going to go. So at 10,000 feet, we may just miss everybody that doesn't want to hang around. Yep, we can do that. And I'll try to hang with you. It's been a long, long day. So 5.30 this morning, a little early. All right. Yes, I had an hour for me to work, so that, that, that plays into this. 1-800-555. Okay, this is cool. Great animation. So play along. An inductor is a device consisting of a coil of wire wrapped around a magnetic material. A capacitor is a device containing two metal plates. Thank you. 
then these oscillations would continue forever. On the other hand, suppose that our circuit consisted of just a capacitor and a resistor. Once the capacitor discharges, the voltage across the resistor would be zero. Once the voltage across the resistor is zero, no current will flow through it. If no current is flowing, the capacitor will never recharge. But, unlike resistors, an inductor is a device which tries to prevent any changes to the amount of current flowing through it. If the current tries to stop flowing, the inductor will exert a force to keep the current going. In the circuit with the resistor, when the capacitor fully discharges, the current drops to zero. If we replace the resistor with an inductor, then when the current tries to decrease, the inductor will exert a force to keep the current flowing. This current will then charge the capacitor in the opposite direction. The capacitor will then want to discharge, and the cycle will repeat itself. Suppose that next to this circuit, we have an AC voltage source that has the exact same frequency as these oscillations. If we add a resistor as shown, the voltage at both sides of the resistor will always be equal. that the voltage drop across this resistor is always zero. And that's because they're equal. Only because they're equal. If the voltage drop across a resistor is always zero, then no current will ever flow through it. From the perspective of the AC voltage source, the inductor and capacitor parallel combination behaves like an open circuit. The inductor-capacitor parallel combination can be replaced with an open circuit, and the AC voltage source wouldn't know the difference because no current would flow through the AC voltage source in either case. Now, suppose we take the same inductor and capacitor we had before, and we connect them in series instead of in parallel. source 
is to the resonating frequency. The more the inductor capacitor parallel combination will look like an open circuit, and the lower the current through the voltage source will be. Details about inductors are available in the video titled Inductors and Inductance. Yep. Okay. Details about the path. That's pretty much where that ends. They just give the credits out there. So the whole thing about resonant frequencies is we have to be able to tune the radio. Now that original drawing we had up was like this, and it had a hump at like one, what was it? Let's just count one. That still hurts. Actually, yeah, that's uh, 1240, yeah, that's right. Okay, we had another spike up here above it, one above that. One here, one here, and this was our tuning point in our radio. So we had that big tune dial there. Okay. I can slide that resonant frequency inside that receiver one side or the other to pick up these two adjacents on either side. So that's how we determine what frequency that receiver is looking at. And it's all based on those tuned circuits. So if you read in your book about resonance, it gives you about two sentences that doesn't mean crap. That's why I went and pulled that and, and put it in there for you, where you can see the interaction between the inductor and the capacitor. That's known as an LC circuit. L for inductor, C for capacitor. You'll see a lot of tuned circuits and radio stuff are going to be just that. You, you might have a lot of other circuitry around it, but at some point, for any circuit to achieve a resonance, the easiest way to do that is with a matched pair of an inductor and capacitor that when they're put together in a circuit, it has a natural frequency that it has to operate at. And by making, remember our uh, capacitor a while ago, our symbol was this, right? If I do that and put an arrow in it, that means it's variable. Okay? Same thing, I could draw that same little line, little arrow through an inductor, and that would be variable as well. Okay, so that's how we achieve tuning of things. It's a lot more complicated for that, but for the purpose of this class and for getting your feet wet in ham radio and getting started off. There are, there are a couple of questions about that in there. You can actually read the question in the text. It will tell you what the answer is when you read the text that it relates to. But just keep that mental picture in your mind. We're creating something that it will ring at, a frequency. If you've ever seen those little hollow tubes that you can buy sometimes in the summer and you swing them around in the air and they make a noise, that is with, with the movement and the airflow across the ends, that is a product of the diameter and length of the tube that creates that frequency. Okay. It's not quite electronic components. Same principle applies. Pipe organ pipes. You'll notice they're large in diameter, really, really tall, down to little itty bitty pencil thin ones over there. Okay? Wonder which one makes the really low notes. <laughs> the big ones. If you look inside a piano, the strings that are in there, they have very fat strings down on the low end of the piano, very short, skinny ones up in the top. Same thing. We're changing frequencies. That's just natural acoustical resonance. But the same applies as it does to electronics. Okay, but we can't use a piano as a receiver. Okay, got to be a little different because it's much higher in frequency. Remember our spectrum when we looked at it from all the way down below audible hearing, just above DC, all the way out through visible light. Okay, if we're going to just be picky and pick one frequency out of the air to listen to, the way we achieve it is with an LC tuning circuit or some derivative of that. But it comes down to that basic building block. Okay. We talk, next week we're going to talk semiconductors. There's not a lot about semiconductors that we're going to get into because our test questions are not based around a lot of that. But we will go through this. Any questions on resistors, capacitors, or inductors? Okay, if you got it. Everybody good with it? I mean, is, is, or am I breaking this down to where you're getting enough that you think you feel like you're, I'm okay? Clear. 
You've all read ahead. You know, my, my job is to not repeat what the book says. My job is to think outside the lines and try to give you some functional usage for this stuff. Okay, make sure you know how to use Ohm's Law. Because you'll use it every day in your life. You don't think you'll need it? You put something new in your, in your ham shack at home, you're going to need to know about it. Okay, one of the things once we get to the end and we've covered everything, we just talk about refreshing and going back through and asking questions, things that we may not, that we need to you know, just touch on. Uh, I'll try to have for you a little diagram that helps you understand what gauge wire you need for what you're doing. Because if you put a radio in your car, you want to make sure that it's sized right. If you wire something in your house, you need to know about that. The other thing in that last chapter that we're going to talk about is also going to get into grounding and safety. Okay, so that stuff's very, very important. All of these little tools that you're getting, these little bite-sized morsels, if you look at them after the fact, emergency room didn't want to keep them. Well, that's good. Well, I'm glad you're not hurt. Young man was in a car accident on the way here tonight. So. Five folks down the hall kind of took care of him, I guess. Tried to. Or at least put a Band-Aid on his hat or something over there. So you're, you're, right. you're good. You're good to go back. But anyway, like I said, all of these things build upon things. So please read through your book. We're going to finish inductors, or not inductors, but we're going to finish integrated circuits next week and all of the semiconductors. Look at your syllabus. I, I, know, I don't remember what we're doing after that, but I think we actually start in the next chapter next week. Okay, read ahead, ask questions. Okay, you can, most of you have my email address. I'm not using the Sumter Ham Radio class anymore, but my ham call, K E 4 C I H, at Gmail. I'll write it up here in case you don't remember it. That goes to my cell phone, folks. If you think it's something in the middle of the week, if you don't want to close it to the class, send me an email. Okay?